Yes, cool. Everybody, thanks for joining. Here's Pharaoh, Ludo, see Charles, uh, Caitlin, hello. Um, I think people will continue to hop into the gaming session shortly, I'm sure, uh, but wanted to kick us off. I think we'll have to bring Paul back up to the stage because he's really important, so I just invited him. Um, but uh, this is the kickoff for the gaming track. Uh, Paul and Andre have done a fantastic job putting together what I think will be a, an awesome eight weeks of exploration. We'll uh, likely have uh, games that we discuss on Wednesdays, games that we play perhaps on Fridays, which we're excited about. Um, and in general, uh, half of the time of this hour is dedicated to getting to know your projects, uh, whether they're actual Web3 games or are projects that are aiming to learn from aspects of game design, which we think is kind of the key uh, skill of many of the token mechanisms that, that we're building towards. Uh, Paul and Andre will be great resources, um, and I'm happy to pass it off to them to, to kick us off. Cool. Thank you, Vivek. Um, let me just start by sharing my screen. Okay. Good. Yep. Cool. Yeah. So thank you, Vivek, again. And I just want to start by saying that I'm really excited to be here talking Web3 and games with everyone, mostly games, I guess, because uh, we'll be in that space for quite a while. And uh, since we, since it's our uh, meeting, I, I, th I thought we should start with just uh, introducing me and Andre. And then we can go a little bit around uh, how the weeks, the next weeks will go before we go into the actual uh, meat of the discussion, which is really around patterns and trust, which, um, which we kind of base from the learn track. So I'll start. Um, I'm Paul. I've, I've been making games quite a while, as I mentioned. I've been making games for ever since, I guess, before the app stores. Uh, I've been making mobile games for around 20 years, did some console games as well, and uh, kind of see, saw the game industry move across these technology cycles. So I've seen social games come into, I guess, become the, the next big thing. I've seen uh, mobile games really get started. And um, as you kind of be part of the game industry, there are certain things that you see kind of Still stay the same and kind of change. I, I am really looking forward to sharing what I know from there. And then maybe we can have Andre say uh, a little uh, intro about him. Uh, sure. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Andre. You can uh, call me Ender. Um, so uh, I was a big fan of uh, uh, web games uh, for a long time. And around 2012-ish, uh, I decided to try and see if uh, quitting a day job in a corporation and doing games full time uh, makes any sense and any money. Um, so I'm, uh, we've started uh, an Enclave Game Studio. Uh, we're organizing the JS 13K Games competition, sending out the Game Dev JS weekly newsletter. So uh, there's plenty of different activities around HTML5 games. Uh, there are also game dev JS meetups. Um, I'm uh, giving talks. I'm, I'm writing uh, tutorials and documentation. So uh, not only developing games, but also engaging with the community and um, doing all, all the different stuff with uh, uh, HTML5 games. Oh, yeah. And uh, I just want to say also that I'm very happy that Andre is joining us. Because uh, one thing you can... We'll will really learn in, in kernel is that a lot of the learnings will really come from people outside of our, I guess, immediate bubbles. And uh, just to show more around JS 13K games, if, if you've been making games for the past few years, it's actually one of, I guess, the one of the institutions of the game development, uh, web game development uh, community, because there's really a lot of uh, gamer, game developers here who can kind of show us what you can really do on with just 13 kilobytes in JavaScript. 
So if you guys find the time, go check out JS 13K Games. It's really also a good way to kind of expand, uh, or expand what we know about web games and what they can do. And the benefit of uh, JS 13K Games is that all the games submitted over the years since 2012 are available to play on the website, but also every single game uh, game's source code is available on GitHub. So you can actually play any of the games and then go to GitHub and check how every specific game was uh, built. And there is also the resources page where uh, we are listing um, postmortems, uh, the articles from uh, developers who are building the games, uh, what went good and what could have been improved. So that's also a valuable uh, resource to learn uh, from other people developing games for the competition. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so if you guys find the time, do check that out. And, uh, and yeah, so we'll, let's get started just going through what we're going to do in the next few weeks in the gaming chat. And um, I, I said this last in the last introduction, but the kernel gaming track really is just kind of an extension of the learn track. Uh, I, I mentioned that the kernel learn track is kind of something like a required reading for people building on the web. And it, the kernel gaming track kind of takes that and tries to inject what I've learned through gaming, what I've seen also the, the some of the gaming people really able to teach us as we're making making applications in web3 so the structure will be um, there'll be a core learning every week um, it should be here on kernel.community slash track gaming slash getting started and we'll just use that core learning as a, a sort of what we'll discuss as we go through each point through the core learning we'll have a crafted reading which will be linked from that uh, core learning and then uh, we also have a curated material, which is mostly just a collection of other articles that would be able to help people, I guess, understand more of the of the learnings. So we will have these firesides every week uh, on this schedule, and then over the course of the program, also we'll we'll try and bring in some other speakers. So this is also one of the things that I wanted to with the gaming track is uh, bring people like Andre who who aren't really, uh, didn't start out in Web3, but have a very, very uh, good uh, outlook that they can teach us around web, around gaming, and around the internet. So that's also one thing that you'll learn through the kernel learn track is you can really get uh, more knowledge from people that uh, have gone through uh, the certain cycles of the internet. So today's patterns and trust. And uh, we'll just go through each of these as we go through the program. And I shared one game here at the end of the Getting Started, which is one of the games from one of the game designers I, I guess I really look at uh, and respect. It's Jason Rohr. It's a game called Passage. So if you guys have time, do check it out. It, this was a time when, uh, when games were developed very differently. It was a time when people were really, I guess the, the, the question around game designers uh, minds then was that our games art can be like make these something more meaningful that's just something that we play and i think this this game kind of tries to answer that in, in its own way so uh, andre maybe you have a, a game that you want to share uh, nothing in particular but like the the general advice to um play as many games games as possible um, since um, you can get a lot of inspiration from other people's games and uh, it's not even to know the market but for like you know um, sometimes after I don't know a few years of playing uh, some totally random game um, I'm getting this idea I could uh, change and adapt to uh, some uh, some new game I'm working on um, so playing those games, even though it might look strange that you just sit and play other games all day, uh, you can always say it's a research, uh, yeah. but it is, uh, um, getting inspiration from other games is like t 
totally the way to go. Don't don't afraid. Of course, you don't steal one hundred percent of a specific game and call it yours. But getting yeah. inspiration uh, from other games is highly uh, encouraged, and even reading the. Um, the, the descriptions of some highly successful games, uh, you can notice that uh, they are uh, saying that, oh, well, I just took th this mechanic from this game and the theme from that game, and it just worked. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, if you can play other games and uh, take from them as much as possible. Yeah, I agree. So, so yes, I think that's a good segue into... Um our discussion, which is really around patterns and trust, which um, which if you've gone through the first module of the kernel learn track, we, we kind of took that as one of the foundations of kernel, which is uh, which is coming from a space of trust and uh, trying to identify patterns in in Web3 and in the in our daily lives as well. So one of the things that that was mentioned in the kernel syllabus was that kernel fellows will separate themselves by their ability to identify patterns. And I kind of took that um, and it, it really speaks to me as a game developer also, because as a game developer, uh, looking at how games are designed, you can kind of see that pattern recognition is, isn't really just a core of cognition. You see it in a lot of games as well. You can kind of see how pattern recognition actually is also used in, in games like Sudoku, for example. One of the uh, one of the more successful games, Candy Crush, and this is a, a more recent hyper casual game, which is really just finding uh, pairs inside the game. So even as we move through the as we move through games across the the across from old to new, you can still see that uh, the thread of pattern recognition. And one thing I want to mention here also is. Uh, before nowadays when we look at games and the and the connection to psychology that games have it's it's pretty well understood now i have a link that i shared here uh, and it's uh, a talk by jason vandenberg called engines of play uh, how player motivation changes over time and it i think it's a must watch for anyone who wants to understand how people now how game designers now are able to analyze whether a, a game is good and whether people are able to play it whether people will play it and one one thing that's really uh, I guess a powerful takeaway from this presentation is uh, the reason we start playing a game is actually very different from the reason why we continue playing a game so we've kind of been able to really understand the, the different motivations of players now and really make games that cater to these uh, to this uh, innate human drives and Paul, yeah, in, yeah. in terms of um, in in terms of those differences if if there's something to expand upon and and also just to reiterate one cool thing about playing more games and um, and I and using games to identify patterns I thought Robert Leshner from compound coming yesterday, and giving his email to all of the Colonel fellows and saying, send me your DeFi product, I will play with it. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. He spends like four hours a week oh, playing yeah. DeFi projects. Um, and, and just thought that that was cool, um, you know, in general. Yeah. Play with one three things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And it's uh, especially in our space where uh, we're kind of exploring what we can do with Web3, right? That there's, uh, there's not a lot of references for now. Like it's it's good to take a look at what other games or even what DeFi projects are doing to kind of like pick up something from there. Um, so so yeah so that's a so now we really know how people what 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 makes people play games. But a few years ago, maybe around two thousand two thousand seven, game design was kind of thought that thought of as more of a craft than a science, and and you can kind of see that as you go through some of the articles in game design. And I shared here one of the articles by one of the other designers that I follow, Daniel Cook. You could see that back then he was kind of looking at games more as a, 
I guess, associating it with something more akin to alchemy, where people didn't really understand what was happening, but more kind of just analyzing what's happening as they make it as a craft. So one thing that was powerful in what he said was that play is instinctual. He kind of realized that the games and our biology are kind of really, I guess, interconnected. And he said that play is instinctual in low stimulation environments where we are not actively pursuing activities, we, we kind of really play by default. And uh, I guess I want to take that as a, as a discussion point with Andre, like um, as a game developer, how do you, how do you design games? Because I know you've been making games since way back. Like, was that a, a process for you as well, really looking at it as chemistry? Uh, so, Obviously, people can approach designing in uh, totally different ways. I know people sketch a lot um, and they don't even start coding uh, unless they have a, a half a notebook of sketches of some core loops, game mechanics, or like uh, visuals, etc. Um, our approach uh, was rather simple. We wanted to build uh, small, uh, hyper-casual games. Uh, and being quite lazy, we decided to participate in game jams because they provide you with a theme you can follow mm -hmm. and you have a limited amount of time. Usually people try to uh, build a full game while we were trying to experiment and build a prototype. And if such prototype on a given theme uh, was interesting enough, uh, then afterwards uh, we were building the full game. So if the prototype was fun, if the prototype, uh, if people liked playing it, um, then we can actually focus and uh, build the, the, the final product. Uh, so it was about um, getting a specific theme uh, having a limited amount of time to experiment with it and then seeing if it makes sense. So there are some abundant prototypes from uh, game jams from long ago, uh, but like most of the Enclave games creations are, uh, I, can, and I can say that, oh, this game was built as a prototype at Global Game Jam in 2017 or something like that. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's our approach. Uh, I know many other developers have totally different uh, ideas. Uh, they even take some inspiration from, uh, not even from like playing other people's games, but in general from, from, you know, traveling to work and looking at the world. Um, so there are so many different uh, approaches and um, so many ways people can uh, create games, think about them, design them. Uh, if, if, if this leads you to a final pl product, uh, it doesn't matter how uh, you worked on your game in, in a way that uh, there is no one good way you should follow. Uh, if you're feeling comfortable with uh, building 40 prototypes before you make a uh, first game, that's cool. Uh, if you just want to sit and code and see what happens, that's uh, also a, a good approach. Cool. Yeah, and uh, I guess, have you seen what kind of games people usually design now? Like uh, as through JS13K games from then to now, what, what are the, the trends you kind of see? Uh, so the competition is quite specific because you have a 13 kilobyte size limit. So usually people focus on what you can actually build in the in the 13 kilobyte size limit. So it's more of a battling the technical uh, challenge. Um, but you can see that um, the games created in the first two or three years and you compare them to uh, current uh, entries, um, the level of quality is, is impressive. People, people are learning from uh, previous editions, from previous uh, games, from previous 
from developers participating in previous editions. And it's nice to see that uh, the developers are sharing their knowledge. It's like you can ask the winner of, uh, uh, of a competition from three years ago, and he will gladly uh, help you with your entry. So it is a competition, but uh, the main point is about learning. Um, and it's sometimes it's interesting to see that uh, there was uh, in the rules of the competition, like from, uh, I don't know, five or six years ago, uh, when it was still quite challenging to build games in general for the web, not to mention the 13 kilobyte size limit. Uh, somebody asked about WebGL and uh, if you can use it. And uh, I said, yes. Uh, and uh, said that, uh, but it would be quite difficult to build a first person shooter uh, in 13 kilobytes. And we had like two or three years ago, we had this, uh, uh, people took this as a as a personal challenge, and we had like a few first-person shooters, uh, fully 3D uh, built for the competition. So uh, that's impressive that the technology went so far that you can build really impressive uh, 3D games uh, within 13 kilobytes limit. Uh, some of them were using WebAssembly. Uh, we had we literally had like. A, real-time strategy game in 3D where you are uh, sending troops uh, through the forest, etc. So it's really um, impressing and uh, it, it looks really nice that uh, the technology advanced uh, significantly uh, over the years and now uh, it's possible to build much more and uh, much better uh, compared to previous years. Yeah, and yeah, and uh, that's something I also want to share with uh, Web3 developers as well. Is uh, sometimes we get lost into looking at the the blockchain, for example, and like really what Solidity can do. A lot of things that the web is already able to allow us to do, and looking at the these games that are made by 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 web the game developers are really a good resource to kind of really learn what what else we can do to to engage our users, and I guess. So just following that track around how, how games are becoming more and more advanced. Uh, the game design of games, as I mentioned, has really become more and more understood also. Like I, I share a link here for uh, Deconstructor of Fun, which is one of the one of the sites that I really take a look at when I when I want to understand how games work. So Deconstructor of Fun breaks down all the success games. So if you guys wanna understand how a game like Clash of Clans, for example, is, is very successful, then it, this is a good resource to do that. So now uh, game designers really understand what makes people uh, play games. And a, a very good quote I find that kind of puts that in perspective is, uh, is this one by E.O. Wilson, where he says that we now have godlike technology to really control the paleolithic emotions of our users. I'm kind of paraphrasing it for, for our uh, presentation, but the gist is that this technology is really so powerful that we can kind of now decide what people will do. If, if you kind of look at the games now, if you start playing a mobile game, it's it's so easy to, to click an ad just because the, the game was really designed for you to, to do that. And uh, that's all, it's really how the, the App Store now really incentivizes development and we can kind of see how how effective it is which uh which is a good segue into what kernel kind of mentions for us to 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 kind of understand is that uh as kernel fellows knowing that we kind of we have this kind of power like especially now that we're kind of making financial systems we're kind of making uh Aside from merging from psychology and Web2, right now we're, we're merging finance and games. So what are the implications of this as, as Web3 developers? Um, and I guess, Andre, if there's anything you want to speak to that, and like around uh, how do you see the development of these games? How, how, do, how should game developers kind of like take a look at that, knowing that this is, these are the kinds of systems that we can build? I, I agree with you. Um, 
I'm not sure what I could add to this. Yeah, uh, well, it's, <laughs> it's very. I guess it's a. Uh, it's really something to think about, right? Like, uh, like. Yeah. I remember when I was making games in social games, I didn't really see like that these are the kinds of games that I've been making, like really trying to add friends to your game or really trying to get them to watch ads. So I think it's it's really a good um, a good practice to to take this uh, learning from kernel and really try to look at the the big picture of what we're building. And I shared a link here around uh, I guess which drives the point more that game design can really uh, affect a lot of systems, even just even not just games, but also like outside. And uh, this is uh, an article around uh, apophenia, which is uh, trying. We find patterns as humans. We find patterns where there aren't none, which goes back again to pattern recognition. So that's kind of like the mechanic that uh, like conspiracy theories revolve around we, we try and find these patterns even though they're not there so so that kind of circles back towards pattern recognition and humility which is i, I think a, a good uh, a good way to to tie that together and then uh, one last part around what a kernel fellow should re be thinking of also is to really think of complementary opposites and uh, uh, one of the points there is the centralization is good, for example, and centralization is bad. And as Web3 developers, we, we can kind of, I guess, kind of fall into the pattern of thinking of the centralization as really the be all and end all of, of things. I remember uh, Robert was mentioning it in his DeFi talk when the moment that they introduced uh, upgradable contracts in their system, People were, were really affected by that, but then, uh, but then they became the, the successful DeFi uh, company, even if they didn't really adhere so strongly to that decentralization point. So that's one thing I I, I want to really uh, bring home. Also, is sometimes decentralization also has good things, especially as game developers, for example. Uh, there's certain things that we can't decentralize immediately. So we need to hold our ideas light and then like turn it around. Let's see if it's something that, uh, that you, something that really makes sense for our players, for example. And um, so I share a link here by Tony Sheng, which is one of the, also one of the kernel uh, mentors. And I think he's one of the, one of the better resource to, to to really give us a more critical uh, critical look at NFTs, at the crypto market in general. And this this is his uh, Substack Stuff Blocks. And some of the articles I wanted to share was his discussions around in-game economies and games. So just take a look at these ones. The open in-game economies make games less fun. And the other one is around how do you balance a game when, when you're dealing with NFTs that don't really have the capability to change. In this article, Vital Vitalik's Warlock probably deserved it. And one other thing also is, uh, uh, Andre mentioned this a little bit also, is that we should really try and play games outside of uh, what we usually play. I shared this, uh, this list of Web3 games also here, which is uh, a good, I guess a, a good overview of what blockchain games are currently out there now. So everyone knows about CryptoKitties, which kind of what started the NFT craze. We know Decentraland, uh, Sandbox, and Skyweaver. But we can kind of take a look at what other games are they similar to, and what do they need to do to be able to, to compete with these other games. As a, as a game developer, uh, myself, who kind of really am still immersed in the, I guess, in the traditional games, uh, you, you, you can kind of see the challenges there are with how a web3 game will, will compete with the, these games that really have large uh, user bases and aren't hobbled by the i guess the technology that's still being built around web3 so andre do you have anything that uh, you want to share around these games as well do you have any suggested games that you think people should play 
Uh, not not specific ones, but uh, yeah, what uh, what you said and what I said uh, previously that uh, uh, you can take inspirations from uh, from other games and maybe you can take uh, normal stick, um, stick uh, something Web three to it, uh, mix it with some other uh, ideas. And uh, you will have another hit. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. my my only thought to add, yeah, is like wh when we look at the Web three games that are starting to get a little bit of traction, if we could dive in onto what specifically are they doing well here um, within Web three? Um, and it's it's not in the ones that I've seen. It's definitely not. Uh, it, it's an it's a minimal amount of Web three uh, required to make the game interesting or useful um, in many cases, but but sometimes maybe it's not just the minimum, that, that may not be the right word in all cases. Um, uh, but finding finding out what is sticking and why, um, and I think um, like Axie and CryptoKitties are, are really good ones to have on here. Yeah, I agree, yeah. So there are really uh, a lot of other games we could Take a look at aside from just the web three ones that that we can take something out of and really learn from. Cool. And then we just go to the last, uh, I guess, the last point before we can go into our breakout activities, which is around trust, which is one of the, I guess, one of the most important uh, kernel principles. And most of us went through the trust game by Nikki Case around how how people will trust. Uh, how about the game of trust and how people will will treat each other depending on how the game is set up and i think the the, the final screen kind of sh shows us what we need to take away from that which is what the game is really defines what the players do and you can kind of really see this also in as I mentioned, how games are really designed to make you do an incentivized ac action right now but in terms of virtual economies we can also see this happening if you I, I shared a book uh, virtual economies by design and analysis which uh, which really dives deep into why people behave the way they do and what are the interactions of uh, economics and i guess virtual items and similarly it has the same threads with what uh, nikki case is saying that what the game is defines what the players do in the market of sufficient size, you can kind of see players always take the rational choice, which is, um, which is what are the decisions wherein they will profit. So it's like a perfect competition where people will just behave predictably. So using that by by, by reading that book and kind of design a system for greater trust, because it's like the the basis of uh, the economics is like the basis of that trust. But uh, one thing I wanted to to share also and have people think about is uh, Nikki Case kind of talks about the trust between players, but as as a Web3 developer, we're kind of changing the, the game mechanics quite a bit. We, we can kind of see these Web3 games involving the players now in, in a bigger role than just players. If you look at uh, some of the games, for example, like Axie Infinity, some of the players can act like a for example, they're like investors in the game almost. And they, we also have like DAOs, which people can, which players can become, um, they become responsible for the governance of the game. So, so given that we have these new kinds of systems now, how do we kind of design trust for that? Which is something I think we should start, all start thinking about. And Andre, do you have anything to add to like, how do we, knowing that this is the kind, these are the kinds of games that we are now making in Web3, is there anything we can do to kind of improve that trust between players and developers? Um, I think it's important to um, remember to not destroy the the relationships with uh, players as a game creator um, in a way that um, you are representing uh web3 and if your game uh, will abuse the technology if you will focus only on 
earning money off of it, uh, you will destroy the, you could destroy the reputation of the whole, um, of the whole sector, of the whole uh, technology, of the whole uh, thing people are investing their time into. So um, I could imagine the, the situation with current mobile games where uh, developers are putting so many adverts in the games that it's it, it's stopping to be a game and it's starting to be a, an application to earn money. Uh, so um, you have to avoid some some things that might uh, get people off of the game or application um, because this will this will ruin other developers trying to uh, present this as a viable option as an interesting option to try yeah oh so, yeah so I, I really think it's a really a lot to think about and i think at least in web3 we have people talking around uh, thinking about DAOs, for example around how to structure those better so um, so i guess continue to taking a look at that and really try to understand things from a player perspective is something that I, I'd want to give people with. And I think one of the readings also I shared, which is uh, just a player's review of one of the, I guess one of the games people should really take a look at if they wanna know and understand virtual economies, which is uh, EVE Online. Because EVE Online was a game that's that's been there ever, be ever even before blockchain. They've been be able to make virtual items that have real world value before all of the cryptocurrencies and there's this uh, review of a player called ttv drandok and he says that uh, he kind of realized that uh, as a player you're really not in a space in the game to be able to define what you want to do just because of how the game is designed and what he said which is a point very i guess poignant quote for me is he says that i just don't feel that this is a game anymore than it is a river and newcomers are raindrops farewell and i guess he kind of rage, rage quits out of the game so it's it's a good reminder for us to to still uh think of the different kinds of incentives uh not just for us as developers but also for players so that we can kind of design that system to be uh sustainable for for all of the actors involved and, and yeah so i want to go through the breakout uh, and I'll go through the, the exercises we'll do after the after this lecture. But uh, I wanted to share two games. So I wanted to do this also is to, to share a game every week so we can kind of play them together. And I think Vivek and I were discussing that maybe we could have a game night tomorrow around one of the games. So the first game is Kakuro, which is uh, it's a variant of Sudoku. It's uh, so if you know Sudoku is really finding the how the, the the numbers will fit in a board, but this one you have to add them together so they 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 sum up to the uh, number on the end. And then uh, the game that we would maybe want to play together is Among Us. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have heard this. Among Us is one of the most successful games in 2020, and uh, it's defining. I guess not just the gaming space, but also popular cu culture as well. So uh, we'll try and set up a, ju a junto around this tomorrow, and we can have people join us. I I'll, I'll help people who haven't, I don't really know how to start playing it. I'll, I'll just go around the tables and help people out. And cool. And yeah, so we, I guess we can now start doing the activity, which is really around uh, exploring what we discuss around patterns and trust and what we what i was hoping people could do is as we go into the tables you talk about your gaming project or even it doesn't have to be a gaming project because it can be your your web3 project and then we can we try and identify the patterns in that project uh what are the other games or any other uh, media that are similar to to the project that uh that your fellows are describing and then we can kind of suggest uh, how we can improve that using uh, what the other similar projects we see are doing correctly. And then we can also go into like trust. Uh, what part of in the in your uh, fellows project? What part of their system can be tweaked to add more trust? 
or is there anything in their system that can kind of be exploited? And if there is, maybe there's a way for you to kind of suggest how to fix those exploits. And yeah, so so I guess that's a, uh, uh, do they have time to kind of go through any of the questions or should we just go through do the breakout activity? Um, I, I think it's good to probably um, maybe maybe go go to the breakout just because we have 15 minutes or so left. Yeah. Um, feel free to people at the tables pull up your game, show it for a few minutes. Um, we definitely have time for that, um, and uh, we'll be at the tables in the lounge. Um, I put the link in the chat to this breakout work uh, so, uh, link. You you go directly to this breakout activity um, and pull it up on your own computer. But yeah. Um, I think, I think going to the tables is great. The Among Us game, uh, I'm excited. Maybe we can play on Friday. Maybe next week, the week after, can find some other games to, to add to the list. Some that, that are being built here, hopefully. Yeah. Cool. 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 Well, thanks, Paul. Andre, for kicking us off. Uh, we'll meet at the lounges for the breakout. I'm excited to hear about your projects. Uh, hear what you thought about uh, some of the materials and generally uh, ask questions. I think we'll, we'll all be splitting up.